Joining me now is Bill Okero, the former chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Thank you for speaking to us this evening. So as COVID-19 continues to sweep across the country, the president made the decision to reopen the economy. So let's just start with that. What do you make of that term, reopen the economy? And is it deceptive in terms of the associated impact that the country may expect? Well, I think the <clears throat> it was very necessary for the government to reopen the economy. Um, I mean, we have really lost significantly. The government, uh, in fact, downplayed the impact of um, uh, the lockdown on the economy. It's, 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 it was disastrous. And I think, um, you know, you have to balance. There, there, there's a need to provide, uh, to be concerned about health. But at the same time, I think you're looking at 50 million Kenyans and, 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 and some of the effects of the lockdown, particularly Nairobi and Mombasa, had very, you know, a significant impact on, 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 on the lives, on, on, on the livelihoods of many Kenyans. So I think it was necessary, very necessary for the government to, to, to reopen the economy. All right. But uh, just in terms of that term, you know, when you hear the word reopen, people expect this sort of vibrancy or energy injected back into the economy. And all of a sudden, you know, jobs will be created quite swiftly or recovered, etc. Does the, does the term paint an accurate picture of what we can expect uh, in this last uh, half of the year? No, I think that expectation is not far-fetched. Um, there is um, uh, clearly... Um, uh, and, you know, what happens is that when you lift the lockdown, there are sectors of this economy that had been shut down completely. For example, in the hospitality sector, um, you know, uh, I'll give you that as a simple example, uh, and, and many others. So what happens is that when the government opened, then people started opening for business. Uh, restaurants are opening, hotels are opening, tra air travel has opened up. Uh, people who are not able to do things were able to do. So I think it does, but it doesn't mean that immediately there will be a rebound of, of all the losses that we've got. But there's significant uh, impact in terms of people getting back their jobs because their businesses are open. You report back to work. Uh, those who are operating at half capacity, uh, probably getting back some of the people to come back on, on duty and so forth. So I think, yes, uh, to some extent it, 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 it is. But the effect, you know, the positive effect of it will be felt uh, over a long time, not immediate. Right. Now, the thing with COVID-19 in purely economic terms is that uh, because it is killing people, it means it is killing, uh, in a sense, our prospects as a nation. The investment uh, in education and health that had gone into the individual, it is also killing men disproportionately. So everyone who has died presumably was contributing positively to our economy and to the stability of the nation. Is there any way to quantify the loss that we are staring at as the region's largest economy? Well, not in terms of the deaths. I think our regions have been spared some of the uh, very high fatality rates we have seen in Europe and in other parts of the country. We still have in the region of 200. I, I think the impact on, on the fatality is pretty low. But the loss on the economy, yes, can be estimated. I mean, we have research that has shown that over 1 million, nearly between 1 to 2 million jobs have been lost. Um, the entire sectors that had to shut down completely. Um, I know, uh, personally, I'll tell you, there are companies that we had to shut down uh, because it, it was very difficult to get out to our customers. Businesses in Europe, uh, in, in many of our export destinations, had challenges. Uh, so instead of taking a business that was importing, say, five tons of something, would reduce to one ton. Uh, so I think, yes, there is significant, and I, I'm sure we will be able by, <clears throat> when we get the statistics from the uh, government on, 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 on exports and so forth, we will. Our, our, our situation is not any different uh, from what we have seen in many other countries where the results came out. And the impact has been disastrous. I think some estimates uh, put that we could lose uh, close to 400 billion in terms of really, uh, you know, it's, and I think that 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 we what we what happened in 2000. Look at 2008 when we had that financial crisis. Our economy growth went down from seven percent to 0.2 percent. And the government is, of course, a bit uh, cautious this time. They don't want to say their projections of 6% will go down to zero. But IMF has warned that many countries will suffer double-digit uh, you know, uh, decline in, 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 in growth of the economy. So I, I, would, I would say, yes, the impact is going to be severe, not because of the fatalities, but because of the disruptions to the, uh, to the businesses and to the uh, economy in general. You remember what happened in, on the border with Busia, on the border with Tanzania, 
we can't. Our businesses could not export. Trucks were, low, you know, if you were trying to get a truck of export to Uganda, it would take a month for the turnaround. I, so I think the impact is going to be quite significant. You have previously argued that pre-COVID, the economy was, quote, growing on paper, but in reality, it was in free fall, end quote. Could you explain that? And based on that assessment, how then uh, do you uh, view the government's interventions? How do they compare to the challenge that we are facing now? You remember last year, there was a time the media, uh, the, 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 the head of uh, state was uh, in the media said, what happens to Kenya? Why is there no money? Because Kenyans were complaining that there's actually no money. Uh, the reality is that the trickle down um, effect in the economy was, 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 was not visible. And, and what happens is why is there no money? And Kenyans are right. One, there, was no, there were no jobs. A lot of companies had shut down. Uh, many people had been laid off. You remember, in fact, many of them blue chip companies. Uh, so what happens? Because of lack of demand again. Second is businesses who are not having any demand. They were, you know, sales were going down. Uh, thirdly, the government had, bought, had, had, had failed or reneged on paying their suppliers and contractors to a large extent, both national and county governments. Uh, that again means no money in the pocket. Uh, banks were lending to government. It was more lucrative to lend to government that was borrowing, you know, domestically at very high levels. So again, there was no money. So when you have a situation where employment is not generating income, businesses had no demand and there's no income into the pockets, um, you are not able to borrow from banks. You are not being paid by government for the services, you know, and supplies you have made. You know, all these things contributed to the situation where we had no money in our pocket. Now, why I say on paper is because what we have seen in recent years is that the elitist, what I call the elitist part of our economy is the one that grows, the financial sector, the ICTs, the, you know, the, but 80% of the, our people, that is not the economy that they depend on. It's agriculture. Um, it's, you know, it's the informal sector. And this is where government intervention is minimal. And this is where people realize that actually there is no, they don't see the impact of the growth. So when the government says we have 6%, 6%, yes, it's very easy to measure 6%. The SGR alone can contribute to half of that, you know, And but where does the money go? You give 300 billion contracts to a Chinese company uh, for, to build SGR, they will get 99% of all their goods and services, goods particularly, duty-free from China. They don't buy locally. The same thing now, when you see this Nairobi Expressway, you will, if you check today with the government, 99% of all the goods that will be used there uh, would be imported, and they will not pay duty. So, the, you know, the, 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 the trickle down is really... Uh, lastly, I want to say that many of the uh, our formal sector, the manufacturing and so forth, the people who own money, the, our rich people, there's no trickle down. What happens to the rich normally is that they are wealth is stashed abroad or in other investments which does not trickle down. And we have seen it. For example, in the in the report that was published recently um, that showed $50 billion uh, being held uh, you know, outside. That's about 6 trillion uh, shillings. Uh, you know, so what I expected the government to do actually in this time of crisis, allow, give people the amnesty. Let them bring back all that money unconditionally. You need more money to come into the economy so that people can start moving. I, I, so I think um, yes, there was there was growth on paper, but no money in our pockets at the time. Uh, I'm just going to um, sort of uh, wind this up. Uh, I beg your pardon, we're running out of time, but I will ask this. Um, so, Professor Njogona Ndongo, for instance, uh, spoke to Punchline uh, a few months back, and what he said is that it wasn't a question of whether we were headed for a recession. It was that we were already in one, but didn't want to call it by that name, uh, pretty much. So in your opinion, are we in that recession? And if we are or are not, you've already talked about one intervention that you thought the government would do in order to bring back uh, funds into our economy, but you spoke of the agriculture sector and other sectors, Juakali, for instance, where a majority of our people earn their bread and butter. What kind of interventions well, then I think would you want to see Kenya, uh, in the sectors? They, 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 we, are, we are facing recession, and that, that's, that's a reality. Um, Kenya does not do very well on exports. Our exports are 50% of our imports. Um, um, but we have, the reason why I, I think we are going to go into, into recession is not because the demand out there globally 
uh, for our goods and services is going to decline because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the problems many countries are facing. But I think uh, part of the reason is because of the pressure of the huge debt that is on us. Um, this year, by December, the government has to pay 1.5 trillion shillings for the principal plus interest payments on loans. Unless we get the some sort of a delay or moratorium or you know or a waiver of sorts which the g20 countries have been talking about we will have a bit of a challenge really in terms of having money because what the government needs is today is put more money into the economy through stimulus but you cannot have money for stimulus when you have to service those debts and um i think that's 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 part of the uh, the challenge that uh, we have so i i'm concerned that there's going to be a recession um and and that that's pretty going that's going to happen pretty soon all right. Um, I also asked you what then you would want to see the government to do in terms of those uh, uh, basic sectors where a majority of our people and their bread and butter. Your thoughts? Good. Yeah, but let me also mention, you know, when you have a situation where the government expenditure far exceeds its income or its revenue, um, what uh, George W. Bush had called during the time of Reagan voodoo economics, where numbers don't add up. Um, you, uh, for example, the tra uh, KRA released figures yesterday that in 20, up to 20, 20 June, that financial year they collected, they were short, they were below the target by 350 uh, billion. They only collected 1.4 trillion. Yet the pub, the government expenditure was 3.2 trillion. So you ask yourself, why the government, why does the government have to spend another 1.8 trillion extra above, above their source of revenue? And, and so, so what happens? One, what, 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 what I, I, I really keep saying is that the government does not have to spend the way it's spending. It doesn't have to. The government spends what people want them to spend. I think it's important that the government learns to leave money in the pockets of people to decide what they want to do with their money. Uh, but la lastly, I want to, to address the question you have raised about the areas that I think the government needs to uh, support uh, is on the SMEs because. Every year, over 2 million companies are registered by Kenyans who are trying to do all manner of businesses. And 90% of them, again, fold up within one year. Why? First, they have no access to credit. One of the things the government needs to, uh, to do is to guarantee access to credit. Guarantee all the credit by SMEs. It's not a big thing. It's not a big thing. How much do we borrow? Our SMEs don't borrow more than 30 to 40 billion. Guarantee it, 80%. Let us have money going out. Number two, get the counties to give at least 10% of all their money to women and youth to start businesses in the markets and so forth. This, why must we allow? Number three, stop the public expenditure on huge government projects which don't have trickle-down effect. Please delay it. You don't have to build all these things today when there's a crisis. I think what they need today is provide some incentives, give some waivers. For example, tax KRA yesterday, this week announced that they're going to you know, tighten screws on all the businesses. I think today is the time you should allow voluntary uh, compliance by businesses. Let businesses start looking for opportunity to make money. But when you're introducing more taxes, if you make a loss today, you'll be taxed. If you don't make a loss, you'll still be taxed on turnover. Um, they have introduced taxes on plant and machinery and every manner of things that you want to do to invest. So you're discouraging people from, uh, you know, from, from, from investing. Um, I, I, I think it's important that the government really um, slows down and allows people to, to generate income and, 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 and reward people who want to create jobs. If I want to employ five people, ten people, a hundred in my company, give them an incentive on tax. Tell them, yes, they will not pay pay as you earn for the next three years first. Give that opportunity. Those whom you want them to retain employment, they have difficulties. Businesses have difficulties. Try to give them incentives to retain employees and they don't, because what is, what is the economy? It's about allowing people to have money in their pockets. They can't have it if there are no jobs. They can't have it if businesses are lacking demand for their supplies and goods. And that's the challenge you're having because if you are buying 10 kilograms of sugar a month, you're now reducing it to 5 kilograms a month because you don't have the money. You probably have been laid off. You don't have that, you know, that, that kind of income. So I, I, th I think there's still a lot that the government can do. I think the government has not changed. They need a paradigm shift. That mentality where you have to tax people, get all the money first, then decide who will get it. I think it's not necessary. Allow people to 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 retain their incomes. Allow people to 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 generate more income by really minimizing all these pressures on tax that they have done in the last financial um, in, the, in the last finance bill. 
Bilo Caro, such a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for your time and your thoughts. We are taking.